Let us pray. Father, this morning we come into your presence. We say, Heavenly Father, only you are our Lord and our God. You are the King of kings and you have made heaven and the earth. And Lord, you chose Abram and you brought him out of the Chaldees and you gave him the name of Abraham. You've seen the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and you've heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed them signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants and all the people of the land. Lord, you used Moses to divide the sea before them so that they went through the middle of the sea on dry land, but you threw their persecutors into the deeps of the water. You came down upon Mount Sinai and spoke with, from heaven by the hand of Moses, your servant, and you made known unto him your holy Sabbath, your judgments, your laws, statutes, precepts, and commandments. But our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks, and they did not listen to your commandments, nor keep your Sabbath, and they refused to obey your word. Neither were they mindful of the wonders that they had just seen you do. They were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets and testified against them. And Lord, for many years you put up with them. You testified against them by your spirit in the prophets, but they wouldn't listen. Then, Lord, you sent your only Son into this world so that we could know you and you would have for us the everlasting gospel. But wicked men killed him, and they cared not for him, only for their selfish lust. Nevertheless, because of your great mercies, you did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, because you're such a gracious God. Now therefore, our God, who keeps his covenant and mercy, even when you see your people not doing it, let not all this trouble you today, and let not this trouble seem little before your eyes today, Lord, that has come upon us. We pray today for our president, our governor, our pastors, and all of our leaders, our fathers, our children. We pray, Lord, and we turn and repent, and we seek your face. Lord, your people have lost their way with their spiritual walk with you, Lord, and they have reversed their values. But you are just in all that you brought upon us. You have done right, and we have done wickedly. Your people have exploited and neglected to discipline their children, and they call it the modern way. Your people have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. Neither our presidents, pastors, fathers, nor our children have kept your law, nor your commandments, nor your testimonies. Your people have abused their power, and they call it politics. Your people have killed their unborn children and called it choice. Your people have coveted their neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. Your people have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of speech. Your people have ridiculed the values of our forefathers and have called it enlightenment. Your people have murdered each other, even as I also have in the time of war and called it serving our country. Lord, your people know your word. Woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what your people have done. They have become hypocrites with their false idols of Christmas and Easter and Halloween, materialism and money. And most of them do not even observe your Sabbath. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask you for forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. Search us, O God. Cleanse us now and know our hearts today. And free us from every sin and set us free. Father, your word says that if my people that are called by thy name would humble themselves and pray and seek to do evil, cease to do evil and seek your face, you would heal from heaven. You would hear from heaven and heal our land. 
And Lord, we're just asking for that today. Lord, we humbly ask you this day, send forth your spirit once more and cause your people to return to you and repent and to seek your face once more. We thank you, Father, in all that is in us, and we bless your holy name. Lord God, bless and direct us to your word, and we humbly ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me turn this light on back here so I won't be in the dark. Some people like to be in the dark, but I don't. I'm a creature of light. <clears throat> this morning I would like to draw your attention to this message. And I want to take a journey back in time. I want to go back to 1998. And I'm going to talk about a man locked up in Georgia prison who had been at war with God for many years prior to this. This is a story or a vision, I don't know, I'm not sure, but it's about a man and his God and his fight against good and evil. This man had been locked up for many years at this time in his life and he was wondering about his future, his purpose in life. So he decided to inquire to God about it. In Genesis chapter 3, if you'll turn there please, you know the devil is good at coming after God's children with doubt and with lies and the devil is about to tell you things that are very discouraging and you know as well as I do. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Conniving, sneaky, going around, lying, and setting things up to make you fall and do hurt to you. That's what he's good at. Well, he come to the woman, it says there, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That's his putting doubt in your mind. Is that really what God said? Or are you just making part of that up? Or what did God mean by when he was saying that? Is he trying to hold something back from you? Is that what he said? Do you really trust in him and what his word has to say? Or do you think it ought to be something different? Well, the woman said, verse 2, to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Well, the serpent's already got her. Already, because now she's adding to the word of God, because God never said not to touch it. He put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to do what? To take care of it. And that tree was in the midst of the garden. They wasn't supposed to eat it, but they did have to clean up around it, and they did have to fertilize it, and they did have to take care of it. And so, right now, here's the first woman in Scripture that added to the word of God. And God says there's a curse that comes on somebody for adding or taking away from his word. Well, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. He's seen the woman adding to the word of God, and now he wants to add something to himself. You're not going to die. God's a liar. You see, some more doubt that he's bringing in. And she brought it on by what she said. You shall not touch it. For God doth know, verse 5, in the day that you eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. So God's holding back on you. You could be a god, just like him. All you have to do is eat that fruit. Well, that's probably what he did. That's how he became a god. And he don't want you to be one, because he wants you to serve him and do stuff for him. But he don't want to do nothing for you. You see what kind of doubt and uncertainty when, you, when the devil comes against you? And, and, and you let this, and you go to bed at night, and you think about things. But if you're not trusting God, the devil's going to use you while you're asleep. Because he's going to work all kinds of craziness in your mind. The, I've heard it said that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so he can definitely work on you. And so this man we're talking about had sent a letter to his warden 
telling him that he would be fasting for 30 days so he could get closer to God and find out what God wanted of him at this point in his life. Well, he had stood before the parole board a few months before on this stretch of his sentencing, and now it was just after Christmas of 1998, and he would start his fast on the first day of the new year of 1999. Now, the uh, Muslim was already well into their Ramadan thing, and they had no problem with that. They just wasn't eating during the day, and they would have a special meal for them uh, later uh, after sundown, because during Ramadan, the Muslim wasn't supposed to eat during the daylight hours, I guess. And so, anyhow, the parole board had told him that they would see him again in 2007. And if they wasn't happy with him by then, then he would have to max out his sentence in 2013. Now, this is 1998. You know, that's, that's a good bunch of years apart. Long ways apart, matter of fact. And uh, if you've ever been in prison, it's a whole lot longer time there than it is out here on the street. And so, maybe he thought the parole board's reason was because he kept being put in what they call the hole in the prison. Well, some people call it isolation. In prison, they call it the hole. But you say he is a man of God, and yet he keeps going to the hole. Well, that's because he was told to quit having Bible studies, and that he was not the prison's chaplain, and needed to quit preaching to his guards and the inmates. One time, one of the many wardens that he had been under told him, while he was in the hole, he said, if I let you out of the hole, will you go back to your cell <laughs> And quit telling people about what telling people about what the Bible has to say. So, you see, when you look at it like that, you see they don't mind you reading the Bible or studying it or anything else, as long as you keep it to yourself. That's when they have a problem when you go telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he looked at it through the bars and he said. With no disrespect, sir, as soon as you let me out of here, the first thing I'm going to do is have a Bible study with the guys and your guards who want to hear about Jesus. And so the warden shook his head and walked away. About midnight, the guards came into his isolation cell, turned it upside down looking for Bible-related material, and they put handcuffs on his hands. They put handcuffed like things around his ankles. They put a chain around his waist and they joined it all together rather tightly. Then they told him to come out of his cell. And as he did, the chains were so tight that he could hardly take steps of more than a few inches apart. And it took him a good five minutes to walk across the prison and get in the vehicle that they was taking him in. Maybe he thought they were taking him to what the inmates refer to as riding the motorcycle. When you go there, there's this hidden place they have in Georgia. Now, the Georgia officials say this place doesn't exist. But if you've been there, you know it does. And what they do there, well, you know, they have this chair made up and when you sit in it, it kind of resembles feeling like sitting on a motorcycle. And they chain your hands and your feet and around your waist and so on, where you have to stay in that position and you can't move. And it's very uncomfortable. But it feels kind of like because they have a sack over your head, so you don't know what it is, and that's the only amount of clothing that you have on is a bag over your head. Other than that, you're sitting there naked. And in the summertime, they have an abundance of air conditioners that they have on, and they come in and throw freezing cold water on you. And they punch you about using rags to, so you don't bruise, and twist your fingers back, and all sorts of 
things that the devil can come up with to give them to do to you. They be, when they begin to interrogate you about the things that they choose, if you don't give them the answers that they want, well, then you have to suffer the consequences. And the consequences vary against some of the things that I just said and the fans on and you're about to freeze to death and you're shivering and shaking and you may have been up there for more than a couple of hours and sometimes you're there for so long that you just pass out. And when you wake up on your cold concrete jail cell floor naked, you're wondering when they're coming back to take you again because this goes on for hours and hours, day and night. You know, one has to wonder, are these men here in prison for punishment of the crimes that they have done, or are they here as punishment for their crimes? I don't know. There it is. You make up your mind what they're there for. Probably the worst part of what they do to you is when they chain you backwards like you're sitting in your lazy boy recliner chair, but they have a thing in the chair that goes against the middle of your back, and when they stretch you back, it really, really is very excruciating. And then they take the bag off of your head and put it across your face and begin to pour a bucket of water across your face. You know, how people can come up with these things to torture somebody and do things to somebody to bend them to their will is beyond me. You know, it sure seems like it's an inhumane way to treat somebody. But, you know, and mostly they do this to people, well, like some of them refuse to march or stand at attention or go through their ongoing inspections over and over. And some of them are there for talking about the Bible, talking about Jesus. They don't care as long as you do what they tell you to do. Other than that, you'll get along fine with them. Well, this man was in the Army. He was in the 82nd Airborne Division. And so wouldn't have been no big deal to him one way or the other. He fought for his country. He even got the Purple Heart for being wounded in action. And the last time I heard, he had PTSD and he was getting 80% disability. This man of God has been put through much in his life by these same types of people. <coughs> And there were times in this man's life that he hadn't seen the light of God's Son on his face for months at a time. One has to wonder again, as I said, how could Americans do this sort of thing to their fellow countrymen? Especially, I suppose they knew that this man was a veteran. This man had served the country. I suppose they knew this when they tried to do all these things to him because they knew everything else about him. But then to come back down here and have to suffer under the hands of these kind of people, something just don't seem right. You know, it's one thing to come back missing body parts like your hand or your foot, your leg, but it's another thing coming back with your head totally messed up. Because people look at it differently. Well, you're crazy. Man, you need to be locked up. And how did you get that way? What caused it? This man went into prison when he was 17 years old. Went into combat when he was 18, 19 years old. Think about it. He knows from personal experience when he came back from Dominican, he had nightmares. Sometimes he went for days and even months not even remembering anything that happened because his mind was still on the battlefield. He thinks the problem began in 1964 while on the PLF front line, <coughs> the so-called enemy right out there in front of him. His first sergeant came to him 
and they were pulling 12 hour shifts on, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Being on their off hour, the first sergeant came by and said, I need three volunteers, you, you, and you. Well, in the military, you know, fighting on the front lines in a military conflict is one thing in itself. But there are other things, like what he had to volunteer for, that they had you doing. And it could be digging toilets or on KP duty, washing up them after meals or whatever. The ones with a higher rank don't have to do that, only the ones with the lower rank. And of course he had a lower rank because he had already had problems. And so he was one of the youths who had to go around and pick up dead bodies. It was all over Santa Domingo. It was 108 degrees in the shade. And they had to wear handkerchiefs across their faces to help blot out the smell of the rotting corpses. So they called a ceasefire. And when they called a ceasefire, they had to go around and pick up all these corpses. You know, and so it seemed even later in his life that he could see all those rotten corpses lying in the streets of Santa Domingo, Dominican Republic. And he felt like he could even smell that smell. When he was discharged, and he went out to find employment, because the way America was at the time, he had to say he hadn't even been in the military. Because if he had said he had been in the military, they wouldn't have given him a job. Even the president had run to, the man who ran for president later, had run off to Canada to avoid, avoid the draft. But he went and served his country. And got wounded in action for serving his country. And now dealt the way the American people had dealt him a blow right here. But when they did finally get him a job, it wouldn't take long before they found out about his military ways and that he had been in the military because his short hair, for one, and most of the people would wear longer hair at the time. And not only that, the things that he did off in space. Now, hey, you, so-and-so. Don't even know where they're at half the time. One of the VA officers who was helping him cope with it after many years told him he had no choice. But he had to do what he was ordered to do. You know, he was an infantryman, infantryman in the 82nd Airborne. So they were on the front lines. And at the time, he thought he was defending his country and doing the right thing. But even so, the problem still came. You know, when you look out there, the way this man explained it, they looked out there as they went to pick up bodies and put them in a body bag. It wasn't so, so much when it, that it bothered him to pick up the men. But what started bothering was picking up the women who hadn't been in combat. And worse, the little children, and some of them infants. One woman with a baby hanging part way out of her, riddled to pieces with bullets. Has to wonder what kind of a What kind of a monster would do such a thing? And when you're on the front line and somebody out in the front is firing and you're not looking probably at what's out there, all you're looking at is a moving target. And if there's something in front of you and it's moving, you're going to stop it from moving. what they have you there for. And so these children whose little frail bodies 
He reasoned. He could not possibly be responsible for this. It was just too much to take. And so somebody else had to be to blame for it. And since God wasn't standing there, it was his fault. So he came up with this idea, I guess, to blame God. Because God could have stopped it. And why did he let it go on? Before he left Dominican, he was in all-out war with God. So for years, he had gone on with war with God. And one time while he was in prison, he asked God after many years later. He said, why didn't you do something about that in Dominican? I, he said, does that make you feel good? Does it make it feel all right? He said, because it sure don't make me feel good. And God said, he hates it. But the man said, he not only hates it, but he hates you, God, for letting it happen. We come to church and we act like Christians. God help us. Because when things go wrong in our lives, we blame God. He's at fault for this and he's at fault for that. But when things happen that we think are good for us, I did this and I did that. And we look for pats on the back. So God said, do you really want to know what I felt like when this was going on? Matter of fact, God said, do you really want to know what I feel like today? Well, all these years, he hadn't given God a chance. And he said, yes, now is your chance. Let me know just how you feel. Because you definitely can't feel like I do about it. So God said, let me tell you something. I'll give you just a little portion of that feeling. Because if I gave it all to you, you would die. And at that same time, as God was speaking, he felt such a feeling of sorrow come upon him that he lost his balance between the living and the dead. And he fell flat to his face on the floor in such anguish that it was just about unbearable. And through his tears, he heard God say, I'm sorry you had to feel that. That's just a little of what I felt. And so today, the scars are still there. And the feelings that still brings him to tears. God said, in Exodus 20 and verse 13 thou shalt not kill he didn't put an exception in there I never read in there one time where it said he said except if you're in the 82nd airborne division and you're on the front lines in a foreign country then it's okay it doesn't say that. God simply says, Thou shalt not kill. And when he says that, he means you can't commit suicide. You can't kill your unborn babies. You simply cannot kill. Now, we try to reason, if we do that in defense of our country, but still, look at what God said. 
did God help us? Because look what it does to you. God knows what's going to happen to us when we have to face the reality of our actions. Because we're going to have to live with it until the day that we die. And now, his youngest son has the same thing, PTSD, as do many other men that have gone to fight for their country have today. But in the movies that you watch on TV, they're doing a lot of bad things. But the people in the movies, you know, they know what they're doing is not real. And so they think it won't affect them. But God, though, look at our country. There are drive-by shootings going on. There are kids shooting each other in the schools. And look at the uh, January when, when they forced an attack upon our, our capital of the United States of America and probably perpetrated by Donald Trump, the ex-president. What has our country become? When we turn our eyes away from God, what do we have to look at but the devil? You know, this man had a choice then, and now he has a hard time living with the choice that he made. But as his VA officer told him, if you had not carried out your orders, they would have court martialed you. That's true. You're right. But he still insisted he had a choice. And he chose what to do because of what some man said against what God said. And you're going to have that choice. We all have that choice in every walk of our life that we do. Some man's going to say, do this or do that, and maybe you know it's not right. But you have a choice to make. What kind of a choice are you going to make? I think that the devil is putting us into these kind of positions, and he's trying to condition people to take the mark when he gets here. Because you've broken down and done what man said to do, he thinks you're going to take his mark. Because man is going to force you to do it. Or else, there'll be circumstances behind it that's going to happen that you probably won't want. So it was not the fact of the shooting of the guns and all that in later years that would set this man off. It was in the quiet time. Yeah with himself. You see, on the battlefield, he had held the line and didn't waver. There's no battlefield, no enemy, no guns being fired right now. And he still has to live with his four. He thinks in some way or another we all have things to live with. He has seen men so heavily sedated that they refer to them as walking and doing the Thorazine shuffle. They look like zombies trying to walk because they're so spaced out because they can't live with the sin that they've committed. And if they took the drugs away from them, they'd probably die because some of the sins are so heinous that people have, are doing today as the devil draws them closer to him and further away from God. But just like him, each of us are going to have to stand in front of a mighty God one day, and we're all going to have to give account what we have done. And I know for one, I know he thanks God for sending Jesus to pay for his sin. But without Jesus, where would he be? But even more, 
where will he be when this is all over? As Marie sang the song, will you give God the glory that he's due? And so, back when he was chained up, he went into another isolation cell. And this time was the coldest time that Georgia had seen in a long time. And he went into this isolation cell for fasting and seeking God's will in his life. He was put in a room in a prison where it was like a medical facility. The cell he was in was probably 8 by 10 maybe. It had glass walls so they could constantly watch him. But he told me by day 17, the nurse had started coming in to monitor his vital signs because of his fast. And they couldn't understand how he had gone by for 17 days without eating. Also on the 17th day, they came in and removed the window because they said it had to be replaced. And it left a big gaping hole in the wall except for the bars that you could see on the outside. And that's all there was to block out the cold. One of the nurses came in and thought it was real cold in there. And later on, someone turned on the air conditioner. And it was really freezing in there with them AC fans on, outside air coming in, nothing to eat. And on day 18, he had to quit drinking the water. Because when you fast, your senses kind of go really crazy. He could smell the water all the way across the room, more so now than ever before. And it smelled like sewer water. And it tasted probably about the same way. And he compared it to what the Bible calls wormwood. Revelation chapter 8, please. And verse 11. And the name of the star is called wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And I think this is one of the things that's going to happen during uh, the tribulation period here. Because they're not going to have enough clean water to drink. Or well, what they are going to, when they do get to drink it, because they've been fasting for water for days on end, it's going to be awful. They're going to be fasting for food and water. And it's going to be really terrible. So he would hold his nose and try to gulp some down so he would be less dehydrated. But within minutes it would come back up. So he knew if he didn't break the fast pretty soon, he wasn't even going to be able to hear from God. So, when the nurse came in on the 22nd day, he asked her if he could make a phone call to call his wife. And she said, okay. And brought him a phone. He called his wife and told her that he was now ready to go home. But she blurted out, not without me or not. He thought about that for a minute. What is she going to do? Come down here to this prison? Or what? How could she be seeing me and when we're over 700 miles apart? But when the nurse came back in to get the phone, she said it was so cold in there that she was getting him a couple of extra blankets. She came and brought the blankets and threw them upon him. As he lay in his bed and began to pray, he had fully made up his mind that he was just simply going to die. If God wasn't going to talk to him, he wasn't going to live any longer. Now you may say you can't do that. Well, maybe you think you can. But some people believe you can just will yourself to die. In the Bible, God told Moses to simply go up into a mountain and die. 
Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31, please. I'll read you the account of what happened. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach, that thou must die. Call Joshua, and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him charge. And Moses and Joshua went, and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. Turn now to Deuteronomy chapter 34, please. And verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Now verse 7. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Yet he died. He willed himself to die. Because God said it's time. You're going to follow God. You're going to have to follow Him all the way to the grave, or you're not going to follow Him at all. You can't be a piece of a Christian. You can't be 80% Christian. It's God's will or nothing. It's 100% of what God says, or you may as well do nothing. So as he began to drift off, the next events began to happen. As the next, next shift of nurses came in to check on his vitals, the nurse cursed and swearing and how cold it was in there. But at the time, he couldn't feel anything. She wrapped something on his arm and did it several times, kept moving it about, tried a thermometer in his mouth and cursed again and said, nothing in this damn place is working. Nothing. It's so cold in here, nothing works. She looked down at him. And said, are you okay? Whether he was there or not, he doesn't know. Because he was looking down at her. Saying to him while he was looking down at her. You figure that out. Here's this man locked up in Georgia prison. In an isolation cell for righteous preaching. His strength is departed with 22 days of fasting for the same people that put him there. His thoughts are upon God and his goodness abounds. Body of flesh is weak and his thoughts are all jarred around. Fasting and praying and night vision stirred God as he lies on this bed of steel. Is he here or past? Then translated he goes, he knows not. But looking down, he sees the glittering golden glass shining so brightly. Didn't see no feet, but he was moving, and he didn't know how. His body is light as a feather, with no tethers to this light. A whisper to God, is he almost home? The shouting and praising to God is heard a long ways off. The light shining and circling him now. Seems like he can almost see home. Is that the Father standing at the door? Memories from his past shoot through him as his life is being played out in every detail. Fightings without and wars within on every side. Where does he turn? And to whom can he confide? Suddenly in all the light, a voice is heard, and many prayers are going up. At first, kind of faint, then louder, like firecrackers, and louder as a soldier firing his rifle. The noise of prayer grows stronger and stronger, lasting in his mind. Lord, strengthen him. Lord, help him. Lord, send your angels to surround him, that no evil will befall him. Suddenly, as all heaven stood still, time was gone. 
not to be found. No sun could be seen for the light in this place. All of God's angels seemed to gather around. A war was being fought, and this was a battlefield. Not a face could be seen, but voices of prayers, a horror of God, prayers going up to the throne room of God. As a, as a big gun being fired, now the weapons firmly in place. Prayers for a wounded soldier going up and up. Suddenly, with a flash, Satan fell from his place like lightning falling to the earth, his forces being driven away. When a moment of time, his feelings returned. Wham! With a push. He felt wet with tears upon his face. His voice now low and faint, he asked a question. And even before the answer comes, in a moment, in a flash of time, boom goes the big guns. The weapons of prayer still on the battlefield, but where? A thought comes to his mind, Lord, who is the one that needs such prayer? Who is the fallen soldier this battle is for? Then a flash in his mind, a picture of himself, kneeling in prayer and fasting for his captors. The prayers of the soldiers going up now as big guns firing, now praying for him. He hears his own voice again faintly say, Lord, let me come home. Let me be free. Then he hears a voice spoken to his spirit. Go back and work for me. You must stand before many people and speak the words of this life. He thought what to say, then said he to him, Tell them of my love. I died for them at Calvary. Lost in his thought, just one more question. Who, Lord, was this mighty angel? Hmm. Who, Lord, was this mighty soldier who fought so hard for me? Mind racing over the years gone by, racing thoughts, images. Who is this soldier so true? Then the Lord showed him an image of you, Marie. That mighty soldier was you praying for me. Then about two days after, when he came off of his fast and he was checked by the nurse, it was off to another isolation cell, much smaller, without any windows for a time, but this time for breaking pr prison regulations of going on a hunger strike. <laughs> I didn't hear that before, did you? On the last day of his isolation cell, at midnight, they came in as usual and turned the cell upside down, chained him up again as they do, but this time they put him on a prison bus instead of a van to take him down to South Georgia for torture and pain. They put him on a prison bus and sent him to another prison in Georgia. But now he felt different. He felt sorry for them and prayed the Lord would send them some sort of thing to get them to repent and turn to him because now he could see where they were going and it wasn't nice. It's almost March of 1999 now and it feels like everything in his life is changing. He feels different about everyone and everything and he finds himself praying more and more in this new prison. He's been able to call home once or twice a week, and he's even been getting visits at this prison. And they have even let him preach out of the book of Revelation once a week in the chapel. He didn't pay any more attention to what the parole board had to say, and some of the guys would ask him when he was getting out, and he would say, Wednesday, and they say, Wednesday? This week or next week or what? And he'd say, Wednesday let me. Because he knew God had told him 
that he must stand in front of many people and speak the words of this life. His counselor called him in one day in October of that year and said she needed an address for him to go to because of the people of the parole board was giving him parole. So he gave him the address of his life, his wife, who was living here in West Virginia. And before the end of the year, this man was home. All total, he spent 14 years in prison. And when he got out, he went to a truck driving school furnished by the state of West Virginia, began to drive a truck, and spent another 14 years on parole here in West Virginia as he maxed out his Georgia prison sentence. He received a bachelor's degree in the Bible College where Jack Van Empey was on the board of uh, Calvary Christian College. He was in prison ministry for a time and in 2008 he began as a pastor at the Pine Grove Church of God, independent, now a Sabbath-keeping church, while he was still on parole. He was on parole up until 2013. You may be wondering why God waited all that time from when he got out of prison to the time he began to preach. And that was just because God said, go work for a man and learn how to work for a man while I teach you how to work for me. Because God said to him, if you can't work for man, how could you possibly work for me? So God gave him his personal phone number. He said, anytime you need me, you call my number. J-E-R-E-333. That's God's personal phone number. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, he says, call unto me and I will answer thee. And I've showed thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. This is where God brought him, set him free, and this is where he'll probably spend the rest of his days here on this earth. Unless God decides to move him someplace else. Because he watched God turn the king's heart and free him. And he knows that God has the power to keep him. His mother was born and raised here, but had married a man from, what, uh, from Pennsylvania who became his, his dad, where he grew up. But through all of his growing years, <coughs> he had been brought to West Virginia to visit his relatives here, like his grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. His grandfather on his mother's side attended the Church of Christ every time the doors opened until he died. And after his passing, all of the children of his said <coughs> that he had never spoke a harsh word to any of them. And that's exactly how I remember him. But he can tell you, this man can tell you, that he cannot say the same for himself. He said he has been a bad person a lot longer than he wants to think about. And yet he knows one day he will see his grandfather again. And not because he is now the best man that ever was, or even one hundredth of what his grandfather was, but because of who Jesus is. Jesus paid a price, even for this man. His grandfather was an awesome man in his eyes, and more of a man than he could ever be. And as we look at our lives, we can see that this man, you know, he's not much different from a lot of other people that we know about today. He just got caught. And he got caught twice. Once by the world, and then the second time by Jesus Christ. You see, men who are what they are cannot change. If they could, they wouldn't, because they like what they're doing, and they don't want to quit. And so without Jesus, they're lost. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If Jesus said you could change, he would have said that. But he said you have to be born again, again, implying that you can't change, but you can be born again. You can be a new creature. Your spirit can be brought to life. Paul, the writer of almost half of the New Testament Bible, said in Romans chapter 7, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. Verse 14. Verse 18. For I know that it is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that's what I do. <laughs> Verse 20. Now if I do that thing that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law warring in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Now here's a man who wrote half of the, almost half of the New Testament Bible, and he's calling himself a wretched man. How could he be free from this? He says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know, one cannot even begin to tell how many men that have come to know the Lord because of this teaching right here. You, you, you can't change, but you can become born again. You can give your life to the Lord and let Him make a new creature out of you. You know, if we look at our lives, this man would tell people when he'd have his studies and such, he said, you know what your problem is? And he'd look them straight in the face. He said, your problem is, well, let me explain it like this, he'd say. If you went to a restaurant and you didn't like the food, how many times would you go back to it? Huh? How many times would you go back? And somebody would say this, somebody would say that. And they'd say, maybe one guy would say, what are you talking about anyway? What do you mean by that? This guy would say, well, you must like the prison food since you keep coming back to get it. You know, you've got families at home. You've got wives. You've got children. Homes. Automobiles. Whatever. You must like it here more than you do at home. I, he would say, you know, don't you know your family needs you? He said, I've seen you at visiting. I've seen a a woman with children come to visit you and I seen them hug you when they went to leave and call you daddy. Don't you want to be there with them and take care of them? You want to leave their salvation to someone else? Are they going to get them saved and are they going to end up in here with you? You know, you need to think about what you're doing in life. Did he say, I can tell you that God loves you. Every day. But every day God is angry with your sin. Yes, He loves you, but He is angry with your sin. Your family needs you. Your wife needs you. Your kids love you. And how are you treating them? Are you treating them like you love them? See, when you begin to think about how each of us are influencing people around us. 
And we can see why Jesus came. These are the words of this life. <coughs> Jesus. And a lot of people need to hear about Jesus. Not about some, something else. They need to hear how Jesus come to set them free. And this message is not just to some inmates or prison guards. It's for everybody. Because everybody's doing the same thing today. Jesus demonstrated his love for us by what he did for us. He took our sin, our punishment upon himself, that we could be made free. And that's exactly what happens when you become born again. You are made free. You no longer have to carry that sin around, even if you do remember it. And it brings you to tears. Because Jesus paid for it all. At Calvary. Then we also remember, you know, there this man had to max out his parole sentence from Georgia. They didn't look at him like, oh, he's a, he's a good man now, and he's this and he's that. They seen him just like he was. The first time they knew him. Hard, callous, hateful. The world would see you, maybe, just like you was. But when he looks at me, he puts on his glasses, and all my sin is washed away. You see, the world <coughs> is doing one thing. But when we meet Jesus, we're going to be doing something else. And I think no matter what the world thinks of us, I think we can still show them Jesus. A part of us can still walk that walk and talk that talk. Now I told you about this man this morning. What about you? What have you been doing? You've been trying to hide behind your sin? Jesus came to pay the price for sinners. And we all have sin. And we all come short of the glory of God. And there is none of us that are righteous, not even one. And we're going to have an altar call now. And as we do, we need to realize, because He lives, we also have a chance to live. Not only in this life, but in the next one. Because we all are, all of us are going to die. And we all going to have to stand in front of Almighty God and give account for what we've done. But when God looks upon me now, I think He's going to take out His Jesus glasses and He's going to put these Jesus glasses on and he's not going to see me as I was. He's going to see me as one of his children. Through Jesus Christ. Who died and paid the price for me. And for you if you'll let him. Thank you. Come to the altar. If you want.